to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ peter responded to the lord by saying lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life. John chapter 6, verse number 68. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of John. In this context of our study today, especially, we're going to be noticing John chapters 4 through 6. And so we want to encourage you to get your Bible and please follow along with us as we're going to think today about Jesus as the bread of life and Jesus as the living water which gives complete spiritual satisfaction to everyone who follows Him. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ uh, in your area. These members of the Lord's Church would be happy for you to stop by and visit one of their worship assemblies. You'll find friendly people there who love the Lord and always look forward to visiting with new members or people in the community. As always, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You can find a host of Bible study materials, CD, DVD, audio lessons are all available from our website free of charge. You can order our CDs and DVDs. And if you've got a, a question, there's something maybe you're wondering about, you'd like to study the Bible further, Friend, we'd be glad to help you with that. Please contact us and let us know in any way that we could help you with your spiritual needs. As we think today about John chapters 4 through 6, in John chapter 4, one of the great practical teachings that we're going to find in the Gospel of John is Jesus' discussion with the woman at the well. Jesus begins to tell this woman about her life that she's been in multiple marriages, that the woman, the husband that she has is not her own, and as a result, uh, she perceives that Jesus is a prophet. And as a prophet, she always, it's as though she always wanted to meet a prophet, and if she ever did, she had a question ready. Well, her question is this. From John 4, verse 20, when she perceives Jesus to be a prophet from God, she wants to know, Where's the right place to worship? The Jews say we need to go to Jerusalem. Uh, our people, they say we need to go to Mount Gerizim. Where is the correct place of worship? You'd be surprised by Jesus' response. Jesus does not respond by saying Jerusalem, Mount Gerizim, here or there or someplace on the map. Jesus puts the focus on the, the type of worship, the quality of worship, and the nature of worship not the location of worship. Jesus said it's not where, the geographical location on the map, Jerusalem, New York, Dallas, doesn't say anything like that. It's the nature of our worship. How we worship is what's important to God. Notice the nature of true worship with me. From John chapter 4, I want you to look in verses 23 and 24. Look at these verses. John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus says to this woman, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus identifies that it's not the location, it's how you worship God that's essential to God today. Well, how do you do that? In spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship God in spirit? Well, if you worship God in spirit, we're worshiping Him with the human spirit, the heart, soul, mind, and strength engaged and in line with the teaching of the Holy Spirit found in the New Testament. You see, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, I'll sing with the Spirit, 
I'll sing with the understanding. I'll also pray with the Spirit, and I'll pray with the understanding. I've got to have my human spirit engaged in song and prayer, meaning I, I think about the words, my motion is involved, my intellect, my conscience, my will is involved in that, and it's also aligned with my understanding of the Word of God. Uh, Jesus was asked by a lawyer, uh, a scribe of the law, in Mark chapter 12, What's the greatest of every commandment that's ever been given? Here's what Jesus said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every fiber of my being I've got to love God with. That's the idea of putting our whole spirit into worshiping God. But friend, it's not all about spirit. We also have to worship God in truth or according to the truth. And so when I worship in spirit, that's my human spirit, my, my emotion, my mind, being engaged with my conscience and my will. But that has to be governed and guided by the truth of God's Word in spirit and in truth. Now, we begin by asking this question that is demanded from this idea. What is truth? Pilate asked that, did he not? John 18, verses 36 through 38. And of course, a chapter earlier, in praying to the Father, Jesus identified what truth is. In praying to the Father, Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Listen now. Your word is truth. Jesus is the truth. John 8, verse 32. Ephesians 5, verse 24 through 26. Or Ephesians, 5, verse, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 24 through 26. Jesus is the truth. God is truth. God's Word is truth. Therefore, if I'm going to worship in spirit and in truth, now friend, I've got to worship according to how God tells me in the Bible. It isn't the case that I can just go, up, go out and do anything I want. Worship, you know, I can't go out and say, I'm going to do this as worship to God today, and whatever I may come to. That's not the way it works. There is a specific way God has told us to worship Him in the Bible. And the Word of God, the Bible, must govern and guide our worship for it to be acceptable. How do we know that? Listen to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Paul said he had transferred some things to himself and Apollos for the Corinthians' sake so that they would learn in him, listen now, not to think beyond what's written. What does the Bible say about following it? It says this, don't think beyond what's written. Where's our guide? What should we look to from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21? And especially for Christians, from Matthew through Revelation is the New Testament. That's our guide to follow on how to worship God correctly. The proverb writer said it this way in the long ago, Do not add to His word, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Proverbs 30, verse 6. We're to, whatever we do in word or deed, we're to do all in the name of or by the authority of Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 17. Uh, the Scripture teaches us, don't add to nor take away from the words in the book, the Bible. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. And so if Jesus has all authority, and He does, Matthew 28, 18, if He is the head of the church, and He is, Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, and His Word tells me I've got to worship in spirit and in truth, and God's Word is truth. And then, friend, not only does my, my heart, my mind, my emotion, my intellect, not only is that engaged, but it's guided by the words of the Bible. Friend, if we're doing things in worship that are not in the Bible, can I ask you, are we worshiping according to truth? If I'm doing something that God hasn't asked for or that isn't found in the Bible, it can't be according to truth. If it's not in the truth, God's Word is truth, and if it's not in the Bible and we're doing it, that's not worshiping God according to truth. Uh, things that we find in the Bible that are identified as ways we honor and magnify God. We find Christians praying as a way of worshiping. Acts 2 verse 42 says, of the early church, they continued steadfastly in, in prayer, breaking of bread, fellowship, doctrine, teaching, all of those things. Prayer was one of the ways they honored and glorified God. I desire therefore that men 
pray everywhere. 1 Timothy 2, verse number 8. When we pray, we pray our Father who art in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. Uh, another way in which we honor and magnify God as God's people, as the church, is through our giving. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Christians came together on the first day of the week and they were commanded to give as they had been prospered. And they gave on the first day of every week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. I honor God when I give as I ought to. The Lord's Supper is another way that we worship God. We remember the death of Jesus as He taught us in Matthew chapter 26, 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And when we do as the first century church did, they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. When we gather on the first day of the week, Christians remember the Lord's death. We also honor God by preaching the gospel. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, we are told to preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Paul in Acts chapter 20 in that same context in which they also took the Lord's Supper, Paul continued his message, preaching God's message uh, for a long period of time there until midnight. And so, you know, the preaching of the gospel is one of the ways that we worship God. Singing is another way that we honor and magnify God. Here's what Christians were told. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, teaching and admonishing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16. And so, as you think about worshiping God in truth, the friend, I've got to worship God the way that He wants me to. There are things that people do today that you just don't find in the Scripture. You don't find a, a concert type idea or a concert type environment uh, in the New Testament. A lot of times when you'll see, you know, especially big places today on TV maybe, they've got a big concert arena as it were and a seven piece rock band and it looks like you're going to see some rock. Oh, where do you find that at in the New Testament? Christians are told to sing and make melody in your heart. And thus, if we're going to worship God correctly, then we've got to worship the way God wants us to in the New Testament. Now, another lesson that we're going to learn from the book of John, as you think about these messages and these teachings, we learn that Jesus is also seen as God because one of the great miracles He did proved He was master over time and over the elements. Listen to John chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down to a certain, at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, knew that he'd already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. This man had been wanting to get in that pool for a long time. He'd been in this predicament 38 years. Every time he got close, somebody stepped in in front of him. Jesus Healed that man with just a word. Now, what was the whole purpose of this miracle? Well, not only did it show the power of Christ, that, that Jesus could heal this man just by speaking the word, but you know, this was a second chance for that man. Likely that man was going to lie there till he died. Somebody was always probably going to beat him in that water. Yet Jesus gave that man a second chance. How about me and you? Doesn't Jesus give us a second chance? If anyone's in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. Another lesson Jesus emphasized from this miracle was His authority. 
They would go on to question Jesus, by what authority and power have you done these things? And Jesus would definitively let them know that He is the power and authority. He has all authority, Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. Now, let's think about another very practical lesson from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John. And that's found toward the end of the chapter as it relates to the finality of all things. Listen to John chapter 5. Jesus will speak with authority and He will say these words in verses 28 and 29. Jesus says, Do not marvel at this, John 5, 28, Do not marvel at this, the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will come forth, will hear His voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus here speaks with great authority and clarity. There's a day coming when everybody is going to hear the voice of God. Those who have done good, those who have obeyed Jesus, those who have walked in the light, those who are Christians, resurrection of life. Those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation. You know, there are several things that are very clearly taught from this passage. One of those is, all men outside of those who are alive when the Lord comes will leave this life the avenue of death. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 27, it is appointed a man once to die. But there's also another lesson taught, and that is that men will not stay in the grave. Jesus defeated death and the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. And since Christ has triumphed over the grave, all men will one day come out of the grave. When people die, they're not annihilated. That's not what's taught. Jesus said all will come out of the grave. Those who have done good will be revived or resurrected to eternal life. Those who have done evil will be revived or resurrected to eternal death. All men will die. We will be judged by God, Hebrews 9, 27, and all men will either go to eternal life or eternal death. Death representative of separation, as in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Men, all men will face judgment, and some, those who do not obey the gospel, will be separated from God for all eternity. Jesus said in Matthew 25, verse 46, the righteous will go away into eternal life, the unrighteous into eternal condemnation. And so as you think about life, friend, there are only, when I leave this life, there are only two places to go. There's not a third option. There are only two options. If I've lived right, I can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. If I've not lived right, Friend, won't it be sad to hear those words? Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment, as the Bible describes it. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Revelation 14, verse number 11. And so Jesus teaches us about finality, about the need to follow Him in this life. Then in John chapter 6, Jesus is now going to introduce us to the fourth sign that He is going to perform, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. You know, a lot of people are very familiar and remember the feeding of the 5,000 because of the great act of humanity Jesus did in feeding those who were hungry. But I want you to think about what this sign teaches us. There's... Uh, 5,000 people, and many believe that would be the men, not including the women and children. And here's what Jesus, what's going on. Jesus has been teaching the people. They've been following Him. They're listening intently to His message, so focused on Jesus that they're now beginning to get hungry, and they don't have any way of feeding them. So the disciples say, do you want us to go back into the city and buy food? They don't have enough money to do that. Um, so Jesus provides the cure. There's a young lad there who's got five loaves and two small fish. Jesus says, here's one, bring those to me. Have everybody sit down. I'm going to feed them in essence. Jesus blesses the food, and then they take those five loaves and two small fish, and they feed 5,000 people with that, to the point that there are 12 baskets of fragments left over. 
What does that passage teach us? It teaches us the power of Jesus, that Jesus is the master over quantity. That he could take five fish and two loaves and feed 5,000. That'd be impossible. Five fish and two loaves would barely feed a couple of people today. And yet Jesus, through the miracle, had the power to feed all those people with that little bit of food. As you think about this, it shows us that the quantity of God's blessings are unlimited to His children. Five loaves, five fish, two loaves, and had the quantity enough to feed 5,000? Why? Because the quantity of God's blessings are unlimited to His children. God has the power to take care of His own. All spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no shadow or variation of turning. You know, we think this is amazing. Five loaves, five fish and two loaves. My friend, Jesus didn't really need the five fish and the two loaves. He created the fish and He created the loaves. Don't you think He could feed 5,000 people? If He could create that initially, couldn't He feed 5,000? He used that, no doubt. That's the way the miracle went. My friend, it ought not to surprise us that the one who created everything out of nothing could feed 5,000 people with just five fish and two loaves. That shows us the great power of our Lord and Savior. But the main point, and Jesus will identify this, the main point is that Jesus, this miracle is going to prove that Jesus is that prophet Moses spoke about in the long ago. John chapter 6, verse number 14, the Bible says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet, the prophet, who is to come into the world. What prophet? Deuteronomy 18, 15. God said to Moses, I'm going to raise up a prophet after you, him who will follow in your, who, him they will hear. He's going to be like you, him they'll hear. Now, who is, they've been looking for that prophet. Who was that prophet? Jesus Christ was that prophet. Now, John 6 also introduces us to the fifth sign of Jesus. In this context, Jesus walks on water. Uh, again, if you can imagine, if I set something on water, it's going to dry, it's going to sink. Jesus was able to walk on the water, proving He was the Son of God. And as a result, these people needed to trust and believe in Him, His ability to conquer these natural laws, to control these natural laws, to manipulate them proved that He was the master, the maker of those laws. Who can control gravity except the one who made it? And that's the very idea that Jesus walking on the water teaches us. And so we need to have faith and put our trust in Jesus. But friends, sometimes when we talk about obedience to God, sometimes people balk at that idea because they will sometimes say, well, you, yes, you've got to believe in Jesus, but you can't do any works. Because the Bible says works no, we're not saved by works. Wait a minute now. The Bible doesn't say we're not saved by works. The Bible says we can't earn our salvation, that we can't merit our salvation. But in Scripture, there were two various kinds of works. In John chapter 8, there were works of merit where the Jews would say to Jesus, because we're Abraham's children, we therefore are naturally going to be the sons of promise. And Jesus said, wait a minute now. God's able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Don't say to yourself, we've got Abraham as our father. Don't use that type of merit to say we're going to be saved. But friend, that doesn't mean there aren't conditions, conditional works one has to do. Meritorious works will never get you to heaven. You can never earn your way. Luke 17, 10, and you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unprofitable servant. I've only done that which is my duty to do. But don't think to yourself, that there isn't anything that I don't have to meet God's conditions. Friend, let me illustrate it this way. To people who say, you can't do any works, do we really understand what we're saying there? Do we understand that belief is also a work and therefore you've excluded believing in Jesus as well? Let me show you from the scripture. Look in John 6 verse 29. Jesus said in John 6, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He sent. It's a work from God. It's a work for us from God. What? To believe in Jesus. Wait a minute now. Believing is a work? Sure, it's a condition. It's not a meritorious work, but it's something God has asked me to do. And so let's not say that all works have to go out. Now, sure, we can't merit or earn or we don't deserve it. 
I can't say to God, I, I've done enough of these things. You have to know. I'll never earn, but there are conditions I've got to meet. Belief's a condition. Hearing the message of God is a condition. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, verse 17. Once I've heard that message, yes, I've got to believe in Jesus. It is a work from God for us. John 6, verse 29. A friend, I've also got to meet God's condition to repent. Luke 13, 3. Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. I've got to acknowledge with my mouth Jesus is the Savior. Romans 10, verse 10. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, there's a condition. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And yes, my friend, the Bible teaches that I must be baptized. It is a condition. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a condition God set forth that I must obey. How do I know that? Here's what Peter said. Baptism does now also save us. Paul was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 22.16. Remember the Gospel of John? John 3 verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so don't buy into the idea that there aren't any conditions. There are conditions. There are two types of work. There's works of merit which will never save us. Then there are conditional works which we must do. And believing in Jesus is a work, not a meritorious work. But it's a condition, John 6, 29. No different than repenting, no different than confessing, no different than being baptized. It's something God has said we must do to be saved. If I ignore those, friend, I have not obeyed the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as John is clearly teaching us, Jesus is divine. He is God. Therefore, to be raised to eternal life, on that last day, I must submit to, I must obey, and I must follow Jesus each and every day of my life. Friend, our prayer and our encouragement for you today is that you'll have the mindset that no matter what Jesus says, I want to do it so that one day I can live with Him in heaven forever. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.